and the door was shut. The groomsmen and the maidens. As a youngster, I struggled with this wise and foolish maiden's passage. In the King James translation, you will remember, these women were not referred to as bridesmaids or bride maidens. They were called the five wise and five foolish virgins. virgins. I couldn't figure out as a child, if they were virgins, why were they going into a feast unchaperoned with a man? <laughs> With all that we know today about a certain kind of harassment, and even worse, especially for the five foolish virgins, wasn't that a recipe for disaster? <laughs> Thank God for Bible study. I learned in Bible study that in those times, it was the custom in, in ancient Hebrew times that virgins escort the bridegroom when he arrives and to take him with lights and songs to the nuptial house where he would encounter his bride. <clears throat> when this procession of virtuous young women leave the house of the bride, the bride is disguised. She's wearing a veil over her face. That's where we get the veil in the weddings. Usually she was deeply moved to see her best female friends and her attendants all in procession leaving her. Because you see, they were leading her and her bride, they were leading her bridegroom away from the life that she had known. She was no longer that person. And the bridesmaids and the groom were going off to her new, her new life and her new home. Only she was left there. She's left alone, her old self and her old relationships die. So she takes a different route, perhaps with her parents perhaps with her father, to the home where she will be lady of the house. Not when she marries, but the moment that her face is unveiled and she becomes one body with her husband. These virgins, these bridesmaids, were friends of the bride who had been selected to lead the bridegroom to the feast. <coughs> but five of them knew that the time of the groom's arrival could vary, so they bought extra oil. The five foolish virgins, or in this time of political correctness in which we now live, let's just call them unorganized. The unorganized ladies had only bought enough oil for a short stay. Nevertheless, all ten, wise and unorganized, set up shop to wait for the bridegroom. They probably did what friends who wait do. They talked, they laughed, and maybe they even rehearsed what the processional into the banquet hall was going to look like. As the day got longer and longer, the ten maidens began to relax, and as night fell, all ten of them fell asleep. At the midnight hour, the cry went up, Look, the bridegroom approaches! He was probably a night owl. The maidens all awoke and all began to get their lamps ready for the evening processional and the wedding feast. They were busy trimming the wick and filling the lamp with oil. And then something came up between the bridesmaids that was never addressed all afternoon. They were together all afternoon, but this never came up. As Val, as Val read to us, the foolish or unorganized ladies discovered they had not purchased enough oil for their lamps to last the night. The oil would run out. They would not be seen. They could provide no light for the procession leading into the banquet hall. So, these ladies panicked and demanded, give us some of your oil so that we may go in with you. How many of us have known people who have not organized possibly, for, organized properly for an event, and then when they discover their lack of readiness, they make it somebody else's fault? You ever know anybody like that? <laughs> Give me what you have so that we can both be in the same state of disarray, the same state of unpreparedness. But the wise maidens had planned ahead. The wise maidens replied, there is not enough for you and for us. If we give to you, there will be not enough for us to lead the groom in. There will perhaps be no wedding procession. There will perhaps be no light for the banquet. This assignment that we were given by the bride probably will not happen if we give to you. You had better go and make other arrangements. You had better go in the dead of night to he who sells oil, if you can rouse him. And of course, you know what happened. The ones who had not prepared went. 
But when they returned too late, the door was shut. Theologian Mark Douglas says what this parable is not about. It can't be about us needing to bring all the resources possible to a celebration, he writes. The bridesmaids only showed up with oil. It can't be about only the wise maidens getting excited when the women hear the groom is coming, all awakened and all in anticipation begin to trim their lamps. And it can't be that the women are divided between those who know the bridegroom and those who don't. The bride chose all of them, and later in the text they all refer to the groom as Lord, Lord. The difference between the unorganized and the wise maids, the foolish and the wise virgins, is that the wise women, by bringing extra oil, were ready to wait on the bridegroom all through the darkness and mystery of the night. After Jesus' ascension, the apostles preached that Jesus would quickly return in the clouds. The triumphant warrior was coming to claim his bride, the church. So the apostle Paul wrote, if you are a slave, stay a slave. Jesus will return quickly and everything will be made right. Paul wrote, if you are a second class citizen known to society as a woman, Retain your second-class citizenship for now. Jesus will return quickly, and Jesus will make all things even. Jesus will make all things all right. But Christ did not quickly return. For 21 centuries, we still search the clouds looking for Christ. For 21 centuries, the church has waited. We now know for certain that this little story is not about young maidens being selected on the basis of their sexual virtue. Perhaps it is a story about the amount of resource and the kind of resource we must obtain and produce to successfully wait for the appearance of Christ. How to not know Christ's return schedule, yet be comprehensively methodically and thoroughly prepared to wait. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, no matter how long it takes. If these five wise maidens had lived in Southern California, they would carry a three-day supply of bad news, band-aids, medicine, food, and water to wait for the big you-know-what. <laughs> the lamps in this story are our very soul. So this precious oil that we need to light our lamps is not the fuel purchased from the DWP. We are self-producing. The oil that we need to illuminate those souls, those spiritual homes, to turn our heart's radio back on, to bolster our faith and wait in hope throughout all of our lives, is produced and manufactured and employed by the way we live, by the way we treat each other from day to day. How many times a day do we pray for somebody else who is driving us nuts? <laughs> the writer of the hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal, one of my favorites, ends the second verse with this incisive lyric. With deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. With deeds of love and mercy, the oil that we need to illuminate our faith and our hope and our patience, that oil is produced and shines out through the windows of our souls when we treat each other with love and respect, no matter what. So our waiting is not pious response, or our waiting is not pious repose, no. Our waiting is proactive, preparatory activity. When we actively pursue peace with everyone, not just the cessation of violence, but a messy, jumbled, sometimes quiet, sometimes boisterous interaction known in this instance as concord, other times as harmony, other times as armistice, most times as reconciliation because we've all done something wrong. When we pursue this, where all voices are finally heard and we make a space for each of us to proactively coexist, we are proactively waiting to celebrate with the bridegroom. We are producing and employing the oil of light that connects with eternal, never-ending light. 
when we learn to more than just put up with each other, but actually listen to each other and learn to see each other through the other's eyes, then a mutual respect and a mutual trust begins to be formed that is the fuel that illuminates that concord and points the way to peace in times of challenge. October. October 2017. What a month. Do you realize that the Las, Vegas, the Las Vegas carnage occurred on the evening of October 1st into the morning of October 2nd? And then on the last day of October, a terrorist armed with a paintball gun, a pellet gun, oh yeah, and a truck, mowed down and killed eight people in Manhattan. That's how October was bracketed for us. And then, as I said earlier in the worship service, this uh, past Sunday, this first week of November, as we gathered at the All Saints service and prayed for those who were already martyred in October, as we tried to keep up with these outrageous atrocities in October, we arrived home from church to discover we had begun November again broken-hearted and undone. As we learned that dozens were wounded and 26 people were murdered in a church worship service. Over my time here at Little White Chapel, after a mass killing, on my way into worship, coming in from the narthex, just walking that little distance, I had been stopped by some mother who lives here in the neighborhood who does not necessarily attend Little White Chapel, but she has marched her child up the church stairs and into the church narthex and stopped me and said, explain to my child where God was in all of this. When people were shot and killed, where was God? Little children have asked me, am I next? Will I be shot at school? Will God protect me? What do I say? My friend, my child, everybody loves you. God loves you. God is the God of love. My friend, my child, I suspect God is grieving right along with your parents and you and I. People, on the other hand, with regard to gun control, are all over the map. We can't decide among ourselves how to protect you. Will a frightened child understand that when she sees children her age? When he sees children his age in danger? When he sees them hurt or worse? We are powerful. We are Americans. We are free. Why don't we rise up to amend, fix, change, and protect? Why can't our spiritual houses, our souls, generate and use more oil? Is it because we don't trust each other enough to work for the greater good? You know the danger and the exhilaration of looking through another person's eyes means that we allow ourselves to be moved and changed by their point of view, by what they feel is important. We leave old ways behind. We learn how to produce the fuel of light and a flight for everyone by trusting each other, believing in each other, so that as a community of lovers, we are prepared enough we are fueled enough to go on waiting in hope and in expectation for the bridegroom, for the Christ. Can you and I ever do the work of God in such a way that we trust each other to take such outrageous action?